Most of the historical plaudits for what we know today as transmission line theory go to Oliver Heaviside, but most people are unaware that the most difficult first steps belong to a man who, in his time, was a giant, but today is rather more obscure. I want to delve into the birth of transmission line theory from the perspective of Professor William Thompson, now known as Lord Kelvin. I want to examine how his genius led to the crucial breakthrough which is now the foundation of transmission line theory. The immediate motivation and application of Lord Kelvin's analysis was the electric telegraph. From 1850 to 1854, the growth of the telegraph was striking. Practically every major town in Britain was connected. The natural next step was to connect between countries using submarine cables. And indeed, by 1855, there were a growing number of such installations around Europe. Plans were being put in motion for a connection across the Atlantic, a distance of some 2,000 miles. But the propagation of signals through cables was very different to overhead wires. The brutal truth was that sending pulses down cables over long distances led to smearing and distortion, rendering fast communication unfeasible. This was not observed in overhead wires. At the time, nobody understood why this was the case. Even the great Michael Faraday, who lectured on this very topic in 1854, had no answer. It was left to a young professor from Glasgow University to solve this problem. And what Calvin produced was a work of such sheer genius and power that it sent shockwaves throughout the scientific and engineering communities. This was a time before Maxwell had published his famous treatise on electromagnetism, and circuit theory itself was still very much in its infancy. Nonetheless, Thompson had two starting points. First, the recently discovered Ohm's law. Today we take for granted the meaning of Ohm's law, that the voltage drop along a conductor is the product of the current passing through it and the resistance of the conductor itself. Second, the emerging concept of electrical capacity, what we know today as capacitance. Capacitance determines how much charge can be stored per unit volt. When the voltage across a capacitor changes, the charge on the capacitor changes too, and the associated current is proportionate to the rate of change of voltage with respect to time. The combination of these two concepts surely held the key to unlocking the model for signal propagation on long cables and transmission lines, but what Thomson produced was unlike anything seen before. Thompson splits the transmission line into an infinite number of infinitesimally small sections. The total resistance and capacitance is split equally along the line, and so the portion within each section will be R times dx and C times dx, where both resistance and capacitance are expressed per unit length, and dx is an infinitesimally small length of line. The solution is subtle but brilliant. Thompson considered what might happen over over an infinitesimally small time dt. Let's say within this time there's a change of current within this region. Now in our circuit model we have a tiny resistance rdx and a tiny capacitance cdx. These two elements will experience this sudden change in current differently. To the capacitor, the sudden increase in current along the line looks like a sudden increase in current across itself over a period of dt. In other words, new charge appears over the time period dt, and Thomson used basic expressions for capacitor current and charge to quantify the new charge due to this event. To the resistor, the sudden increase in current will mean that there is, in that moment, a difference in current across itself, over the profile of the line. Thompson also found an expression for quantifying the amount of charge associated with this event as a function of the change in current over dx. The beauty of Thompson's analysis is the understanding that the change in current from one infinitesimal moment to the next is the same as the change in current from one position on the line to another infinitesimally close position 
position along the line. Thompson converts these changes in currents into changes in charge. Since we're able to calculate the same charge based on capacitive effects which vary with time and then resistive effects which vary with position, linking these two phenomena leads to a way to solve the problem as a function of both time and position simultaneously. In other words, this is an exact solution for the transmission line. This equation will tell you what the voltage on the line must be as a function of both time and position on the line. By equating the way that charge varies with voltage, both as a function of time and as a function of position, Thomson now had an equation that represented a mathematical rule for what should always happen on a transmission line. This equation might look complicated, but really it's incredibly simple. The rate of change of voltage along the time axis is proportionate to the rate of rate of change along the distance axis. The resistance and capacitance are the constant of proportionality between these two things. So with the tap of a telegraphist's finger and the initial condition of a pulse, it's possible to model the evolution of the signal as it propagates down the line. We need a mathematical solution which satisfies this equation for all points along the line for all moments in time. Luckily for Thompson, his equation was practically the same as Fourier's heat equation, and the mathematical solution for the initial condition of a short pulse on one end of the line was immediately available. With the help of modern technology, we can easily use this equation to produce a three-dimensional graph which shows the evolution of the pulse as a function of both time and distance. And we can draw slices across the time axis to show the expected arrival curve at a particular distance away from the transmitter. In his famous paper, Thomson produces his own set of curves, demonstrating how the pulse becomes dispersed as it travels. Thomson also remarks on a practical observation that might have catastrophic consequences on the prospect of a transatlantic telegraph cable. If you plot the arrival curve for various distances and you note the peak of the current pulse, the time to peak increases as the square of the distance traveled. So here at 8,000 kilometers, the time to peak is four times what it was at 4,000 kilometers. This is hugely significant to telegraphers because you need one pulse to be gone before you can transmit another. To elaborate his point, Thompson gives the hypothetical example of a telegraph cable stretching 14,000 miles, which is halfway around the globe. Based on the same observed time to peak as the Greenwich Brussels cable, a telegrapher would need to leave at least eight minutes between transmissions. Fortunately, the transatlantic cable is only 2,000 miles in length. So based on Thomson's predictions, 10 seconds or so would be needed between pulses. But as we've seen, Thomson's analysis has shed light on the fact that the resistance and capacitance of the transmission line have a fundamental impact on the dispersion. Put simply, you want to keep the resistance and capacitance as low as possible to minimize the delay to the peak of the current pulse. We see here why overhead wires present no such problem to the telegrapher. Take a look at the difference in capacitance between a typical submarine cable and a typical overhead wire. The extra capacitance in the cable, which is largely unavoidable, is the major culprit. Whereas a pulse will travel several thousand kilometers and remain crisp and sharp with very little time to peak, a cable will disperse the signal quickly and the time to peak is orders of magnitude greater than the overhead wire. Another remarkable consequence of Thomson's analysis is the correct observation that there is no regular velocity of transmission. This is the very first time this idea was presented in the context of signal propagation. Thomson's equations predict that higher frequencies will travel at a higher velocity but attenuate faster than lower frequencies. This was before we knew that electricity had an upper speed limit of the speed of light. Thomson explains that for a signal like a telegraph pulse, which we now know is made up of the sum of many frequencies, the pulse will smear and distort. Basically, this is the first time signal propagation was described as a frequency dependent phenomena. 
Around three years following the publication of Thomson's groundbreaking new model for long cables, the first successful transatlantic cable was finally laid. The design of the cable was subject to fierce debate, whereas Thomson wanted a thicker conductor to minimise the resistance and, as his analysis shows, minimise the distortion, chief electrician Wildman Whitehouse argued for a thinner, cheaper conductor. It was the latter who ultimately prevailed, in part due to the scepticism over Thomson's law of squares. Nonetheless, the cable was successfully installed and for a time appeared to work. This is a copy of the first messages sent over the cable between Trinity Bay in Newfoundland, Canada and Valencia in Ireland. Unfortunately, communication speeds were sluggish. It was reported that the message from Queen Victoria took 16 hours to send and receive. Furthermore, the line did not operate for very long at all. In a rather foolish act of madness, Whitehouse, who did not believe in Thomson's law of squares, decided that a higher voltage would improve communication speeds. Of course, this would do nothing of the sort, and instead, the insulation of the cable was damaged beyond repair and all communication was lost. The next transatlantic cable would be laid in 1866. It incorporated 50% thicker insulation and three times the weight of copper per nautical mile. According to Thomson's theory, this would result in improved transmission speeds. And indeed, this proved to be the case. Now the cable could transmit eight words per minute. The age of transatlantic communication had truly been reached. Following the success of the 1866 cable, Professor William Thomson was knighted by Queen Victoria for his work on the transatlantic telegraph project. He chose the name Lord Kelvin after a small river that passes close to his laboratory in Glasgow. In many ways, the story of the transatlantic cable is one of perseverance. But it's also a story of how a project that seemed to be infinite in scale was solved by imagining the problem at an infinitesimal scale. Although the story of transmission line theory was far from over and other giants would soon follow, all would hail Lord Kelvin as the towering genius who made those crucial first steps. <laughs>